Hi everyone. I am so glad you have joined us today for our From the Garden to the Kitchen webinar. My name is Karina. I work at Brimbank City Council as an environmental educator. I'd like to begin this webinar by doing an acknowledgement of country. On behalf of Brimbank City Council, I would like to pay my respect and acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land on which our municipality sits. Council recognises the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who contribute to our community. We pay our respect to the wisdom of Elders past, present and emerging. Okay, I'm going to stop my, sorry, you go ahead Karina. Now I'm hoping that you can all hear me and that you are familiar with webinars. We want to keep this session as interactive as possible, so if you have any questions at any time, please type your questions using the chat tab at the bottom of the webinar window and Simone will answer them at the end of the session. Feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself now and tell us what school you are from as we would love to hear from you. We are recording the session today so all the microphones have been muted and cameras have been turned off. Feel free to change your participant name if you wish using the participant tab at the bottom of the webinar window. We will also be running a number of polls to provide an element of fun. So don't be surprised if a window pops up on your screen asking a question or two. Now I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Simone Brookman has been a keen gardener her whole life. She has an interest in permaculture, community and school gardens, environmental education and creating warm and inviting spaces outdoors that are abundant in beauty, food and wildlife. Welcome Simone. Thank you Karina. I'm just going to first introduce um, the organisation I work for. It's a non-profit called Cultivating Community and we've been running for over 20 years. We envisage a joyful connected communities who care for each other and our earth and our aim is really to inspire a healthy and just world by providing nourishing and informative food and gardening experiences for our clients. Um, our program areas cover food systems, community gardens and garden education in schools and we provide management and oversight across 20 public housing community gardens. And in doing so, we support over 700 gardeners to grow their own food. Our community food centres and activities allow people to gather and connect over food, sharing, learning and some skills as well. So that's a little bit about cultivated community. Um, what we're going to be looking at today. So we are first going to take a tour around the kitchen garden with Joanna, the cultivating community garden specialist at Mother of God Primary School in Ardea. Um, this is a video that was taken last week. And then we'll be looking at how to harvest, prepare, dry and store seeds that you can collect from the kitchen garden. And we'll be going over some of the do's and don'ts of um, collecting and storing seeds. Um, we'll also be looking at some seed saving activities. Um, we're going to be making seed tape and also seed packets and that's video content as well. And lastly, we're going to have a cooking demonstration where I'll show you how to make a really colourful vegetable salads in a jar and pickled vegetables in a jar. These are really very simple recipes that require very little in regards to kitchen equipment. So they'll be really great for um, early primary, probably up to senior primary, they'd love it. This webinar contains all pre-recorded footage to keep the length down of the webinar to about 50 minutes, so we're not going to be running over time. I think it's a great time now, Karina, if we could probably do our first poll. Yes, sure, Simone. So I'll just open up the polling now. The question I'm going to ask you all is how comfortable do you feel about gardening and cooking a simple dish with your students? It's a multiple choice question, so feel free to answer it when it pops up on your screen in just a moment. So 
hopefully everyone can see it. Yes, some people have started answering. Excellent. Oh, we've got 60% done. Well, nearly everyone's done very quickly. 80% voted. We're still going, we've still got a few more people. We'll just wait a few more seconds and see if we can get everyone had 36 answers i think we will leave it there yeah okay 37 is pretty good all right i'll end the poll now so you can all see the results Okay, so we can see the majority of the people are enjoying working in the garden with the kids sometimes. Um, so there's people here who have a lot of knowledge and obviously a lot of comfort with um, gardening and cooking with kids. And then we have also some people, if they were pushed, they'd give it a go. I understand that as well. So that's totally fine. Hopefully we will be able to assist you with some new ideas and can learn some new things today um, on this webinar. Fantastic, I'll stop sharing now. Okay, I'll just get rid of that as well. Okay, so our first web um, video we're going to look at today is of Mother of God Primary School and I will let um, basically you guys just view and enjoy. Hi, I'm Simone from Cultivating Community. Hi, I'm Joanna from Cultivating Community and I'm here at Mother of God School and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land on which this garden stands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'll be showing you around the school garden today. I would also like to say thank you to the Dame Frost Women's Centre for the supplying of the seedlings that we're going to have a look at today and also to Brimbank Council for putting on this fantastic webinar that you guys are going to get to experience today as well. So firstly, I'll talk a bit about the history of this garden. The community garden has been here at Mother of God for over 10 years. And because of that, we're very lucky to have a lot of mature fruit trees uh, and other plants in the garden, as well as some of the uh, annual seedlings and uh, vegetable garden beds that I'll show you uh, now. So these are four of our uh, veggie beds here. And in this one here, we've got some of the seedlings from the Dame Phyllis Frost Centre, which was a really great uh, thing to have for our school. And we're very uh, thankful for that. In particular, we've got two types of lettuce growing really well here. Uh, this is the iceberg and the cos. And they're a great one to grow over these cooler months. And I like to use them in with to cook with the kids because they're so versatile, in particular, I like to make like a San Choy Bao kind of uh, dish, which is really flexible. You can actually put any kind of filling that you like inside the crisp lettuce, um, which could include things like pre-cooked rice mixed with some herbs from the garden or even uh, chopped tofu, uh, anything at all really. And you can just roll it up in the lettuce with a bit of soy sauce to make a really tasty little dish for tasting in the garden. We've also got some uh, silver beet just here and spinach. Uh, also growing really well. And they're another couple of uh, really reliable uh, veggies for these cooler months as well. Another thing that's really good at this time of year is some coriander, which you can see over here. And that's really fun for tasting and cooking in the garden. And over here, we've also got some snow peas and peas in a pod, both of which are really great crops to grow from seed. The seeds are quite large, they're easy for kids to handle and germinate really well during these cooler months and right through until spring. This is something you could be planting now as well. A dish that I like to make is a Japanese fried noodles. It's a yaki udon and the snow peas are really good in that one too. I'll show you some of the other things in this garden. 
Um, so there's quite a lot that we're growing all together uh, in this garden bed. We've got some carrots and beetroot, also a bit of celery and some edible flowers here as well. There's quite a lot of weeds poking through as well. I'm not too concerned about those. I am trying to reduce them a little bit, but they are doing us a bit of a service by keeping the soil covered. And over here, we've got some broad beans, another great, really reliable crop to grow in your edible garden. We've planted these ones in seeds in the autumn and they'll be developing their pods as we come later into spring. And they're another one that's actually really great for just tasting in the garden because you can eat the beans raw and as well as cooked. There's a broad bean dip, which is one of my favorite recipes. The other thing about this garden is we've got a few different companion plants. These are the calendulas, which we've got growing in a few of our garden beds. And these flowers are actually also edible. So you could add that to any salad or even just by themselves. Ah, uh, the petals are really great. The California poppies that we're also growing here, they're to attract pollinators to our garden, as well as the little uh, alyssums down here with the, the very small flowers are good for attracting the smaller good bugs. Another one of the great edible flowers which we have here in this garden is nasturtiums. They're really versatile and you can see them here spilling over the edge of this garden bed. The flowers are edible. You can suck the nectar from the back section. You can eat the petals. Oh, that was sweet. You can eat the petals just for tasting or in a salad. And the young leaves as well have quite a peppery flavor. We're very lucky in this garden to have quite a few mature fruit trees. These two here are two apple trees. One of my favorites for a school garden. And the main reason is because they bear the fruit in the autumn and a lot of the other summer fruiting ones will be fruiting during school holidays. So that's something I try and avoid. I've also got some beautiful flowers here in front of them. This is a salvia and this is really fun to actually suck the nectar. A lot of the students like to call these honeysuckles. They're also really good for attracting pollinators and beneficial insects. This is a slightly more unusual one, which is, gets called the tree marigold, which has a beautiful fragrance in the foliage as well. As well as apples, I would say pears are also a really good choice for a school garden. For similar reasons, they're really productive and also producing their fruit during the autumn season. So this is our pear here. There's a little bit of maintenance of fruit trees in a garden, but I think they're so worthwhile. Another one of my favorite fruit trees for a school garden is the mulberry, which you can see here. They're really hardy, very easy to grow and produce an abundance of sweet fruit. This will be ready in term four, so before the summer holidays begin. So I'll show you our composting system here at school. This is to take food waste from our classrooms. Each classroom has a compost caddy and we have compost monitors from grade six who have volunteered to empty those caddies every day. Composting can be tricky in schools, but the system that's working really well for us here at the moment is to empty all those caddies every day into one of these, which is located in the main playground. And then once a week in garden time, the compost monitors bring this bin over to the garden and we empty all that food waste into the aero bin. Then we can also add some straw. You could also use shredded paper for this. And we can mix the compost as well. Aeration is very important. So there's lots of worms in here that you can see. And what I love to see is that it's nice and moist without being too wet. Look at that. To make that process really simple, I've got these instructions for the students in garden time. We've got worm farms here at school as well. Most of our food waste is recycled through the aero bin, but we do use the worm farms more as an educational tool. 
This one is the Hungry Bin, which is a really well-designed system. Underneath this blanket, the worms are in a single chamber, which means they have a much larger volume to keep them cool and they survive much more readily through the summer holidays. The worm liquid is goes down into this tray here and the worm castings can be removed by taking off this tray from the base here. We do have this smaller worm farm as well, which is more of a domestic style. And this is one which I use for classes to adopt the worms for a term. And it's more of a learning experience. The structure of our garden program here is that the students come once a week to the garden with their teacher and I run a class for them for an hour. Each class gets to come for two terms over the course of the year. All the different grades are involved. And we do gardening as well as cooking activities with our produce. One of the highlights of the garden program here is that we have three chickens. These are silky bantams and each week one of our student groups is caring for the chickens. They're really important in a garden like this, both for the experience for the students as well as what they produce for the garden. So they give us eggs and also their manure is an important part of our compost system. Okay, huge thanks to Joanna for putting out a time for that video as well. Um, we're going to have a look at seed saving now. So um, basically, if you want to save seeds, do a seed saving activity with your students and you want it to be an easy one, then it really all has to be about beans. The legumes are by far the easiest seed to save and amongst the easiest to germinate. So you'll have a far better success rate with them than most other seeds. So give them a go. When growing a plant to save its seed, it's very different from growing it to eat. And this, and usually you really can't get both. So for a plant like lettuce to produce seeds, you must wait for it to send up these gangly flower stalks, as we can see here. And they eventually produce these tiny seed pods. By this time, the lettuce leaves are becoming yellow, shriveled and bitter, and very undesirable to eat. So you really don't want to be eating them anyway. Um, it's the same with most crops. You don't eat it and save the seed. It's either one or the other. The good news is, though, that a single plant produces many seeds. So you can get way more plants again next season. Always save your seeds from your best plants. Um, to save seed is to participate in natural selection. So um, if you save seeds only from your biggest tomatoes of the bunch and replant them year after year, you're going to eventually end up with seeds that produce plants on which all tomatoes are bigger. If you want tomatoes to ripen early, you save the seed from the first fruit to ripen each year. If you want disease resistant plants, then you definitely don't want to be saving seeds from those that are disease infested. This is essentially what professional plant breeders do. You don't really need to get too scientific about it. But a rule of thumb is that only save those seeds from your healthiest, most robust and definitely tastiest plants. You do have to work to get those seeds. So here we have a 14th century image of two men threshing wheat with flails that are wooden sort of rotating beating sticks. So this has been going on since the dawn of time. Seeds come in an array of husks. There's pods, there's capsules and other coverings, which are not often easily removed. In contrast to collecting grains of wheat, we also have carrot seeds that are no bigger than a baby flea. And quite often they disappear into the nearest crack as you try to knock them loose from their seed heads. So it's a really good idea to collect these small seeds in paper bags and shape the seed heads around in them. That way you don't lose too many. Also, the removal of seeds can involve threshing, as we see here. So that's when we separate that seed from the plant. We could see the wheat lying down on the ground and also winnowing, that's when we're separating that seed from its outer hull. Seed saving can be definitely be messy. And we'll see this in some of the video I have up next about saving seeds. Seeds that develop in sort of wet, fleshy fruit. So these include tomatoes, melons and cucumbers as well as opposed to dried seed heads or pods. In the case with most greens, there's also herbs and legumes, often require some extra steps to extract them. 
such seeds is typically encased in sort of a gel sack from which it's not easily removed. The best way to remove this, as it turns out, is to put it in a jar or bucket with a bit of water and let the liquid ferment for a bit. The fermentation process dissolves the gel around the seed and improves the germination rate of the seed. You can then strain that seed from the liquid and then you can dry them out on a paper towel afterwards. <clears throat> Seeds of some crops are definitely easier to save than others. And some crops are, are self-pollinators, which means individual plants are fertilized by their own pollen. Um, pollinators such as insects transfer pollen from the male part of the flower, that's the stamen, to the female part of the flower, which is the pistil. And these crops include the list we have up here. So beans, peas, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, lettuce, spinach, and cauliflower. Um, and they're amongst the easiest to save because you don't really need special botanical knowledge to ensure that your seeds will grow out true to type. So you won't have any weird mutants. Seeds aren't viable until they're fully ripe. This is something you definitely need to remember. So optimal seed maturity is usually later than optimal crop maturity. So beans and pea seeds are not ready until the pot is brown, dry, and beginning to split open and quite often is drying on the vine. This is true of any seed that grows in a pod, which includes most greens. Corn seeds um, should definitely be allowed to dry on the cob in the field. And some vegetables, including cucumbers and eggplant, should not be picked for seed until they are overripe and beginning to shrivel up and rot. Well-dried seeds are definitely viable seeds. Drying out um, is essentially the final stage of ripening and ensures that the seed does not become mouldy while you're waiting to plant it next year. Wet seed, once it's been extracted from its fermented glue, like with tomatoes and melons, must be spread out onto dry paper in warm location, ideally with some source of light. To determine if your seed is sufficiently dry, what you should do is always just push a fingernail into it. And if it gives a little bit, it's not ready yet to be um, packed away and stored. Proper storage is definitely important with seeds and dried seeds should be placed in paper envelopes or seed packets labeled with the name of the variety and the date it was harvested. Here we have an image of my seed collection of vegetable, herbs and ornamental plants. To ensure longevity, keep these seed packets in a cool, dark place. Any seed stored this way should remain viable for at least a few years, though some crops may take up to a decade or more. The template for the seed packets that you can see in this image um, will be made available to you on the Brimbank website at the end of this webinar and I'll show you how, how to make these in the upcoming video. In this section what we're going to take a look at is we're going to look at the collecting of seeds, we're going to look at the preserving of seeds or drying of seeds and also we're going to look at how to store and package our seeds as well so we'll look at some vegetables that are ready to um, be har the seeds are ready to be harvested um, and we'll also look at um, how to make seed packets and how to make your own seed tape as well so when we're collecting seeds um, we need to remember that we need to collect them from fruit that we won't necessarily use for eating so this will be fruit that quite often is left on the vine for longer and it's grown quite large. Here we have a zucchini that I have grown specifically just to collect the seeds. So what we need to do is we need to collect it from the fruiting area. So I cut off that top section. Cut down. Cut down the other side open up and hopefully we have some viable seed in here. So what we can see is we can see some of the seeds here and probably grab a spoon oh, there it is. and we can pull out the seed that way let's see what we can find and here we have some seeds in here
just go to the other side. See if we can see any good seeds in here. Oh, here's some better seeds. So that was the zucchini. So we're now going to move on to a really old gourd that I've had sitting around in the garden for quite a while. Give it a go. Cut into that. And what we'll find in here is we have a lot of the seed growing inside the gourd. So here we have the seed of the gourd here. It doesn't look too bad. It looks pretty dry and it doesn't look like I'll need to dry that out onto paper. So we have a lot of good seeds in here that we could possibly use. Sort of don't want the ones that are mouldy. There are some that have gotten a little bit of mould on them, probably because of winter. But there's a lot of here that looks still pretty viable. So I'll end up probably using these ones here. Okay, so with cantaloupe, what we have here is we have seeds and quite often that's in a very soft um, membrane. You'll quite often find things like tomatoes also have this really soft membrane around them. So when we're removing seeds from things like cantaloupe and tomatoes, we need to then put those seeds into water. We can either wash those seeds off like this. And then we'll find that quite often we'll have a little bit of slime around it. These are pretty good. These don't have very much slime on them. But if they do, what you do is you would leave this in here to ferment, say, for instance, for maybe uh, two to three days or up to a week at the most. That will then take the slime off there and you'll find that they will be able to germinate a lot easier. So when we're drying these out and putting these on paper, we just want to lay them out on newspaper like this, or paper towel if you have it. And then to make life a little bit easier, you can also use the base of a paper bag. And this way we can also put them in there. That means that they can be dried, transported around safely um, in your classroom. Um, don't forget to also remember to maybe write the name either on the paper or on the newspaper, just so you know what seeds you have there. So once you have a variety of dried seeds, a really good thing to make would be the seed tape. You can actually make your own and this would be a really good maths exercise to do with your kids. You could look at um, measurement, you could use this for division, you could use this for fractions as well, a really good exercise. So it's a matter of just getting long sheets of paper. Um, you can use newspaper, you could use uh, white paper or paper towel as well. Um, what you can do is you could look up how far apart certain plants need to be measured. So here I have some broccoli seeds here. Uh, first thing I'd need to do is maybe to do an abbreviation of what I have. So I'm just writing down I've got broccoli on there on this. I could measure it out. Say for instance I might decide that I'm going to measure this out uh, about every 60 centimetres or so. Okay, so here I've got a couple of dots on here where I might like to measure out um, where I'm going to put my broccoli. 
The next thing I would then do is I've made up just a really simple paste out of flour and water, which is non-toxic um, for the kids. Kids can probably make that themselves. They'll probably enjoy that. And just where the dots are, I just put a little bit of that paste. And on each one of those dots, I put a little broccoli seed, very tiny. So you could do these with the tiniest seeds, maybe carrot seeds, which are microscopic. Basil seeds you could do this with. And then you have your tape ready to go. So put this aside. Um, once the uh, glue has dried, this can then be put aside and these can be sewn directly into the soil. So this is a great exercise where you can just create your little furrow in the ground and then sew this directly into the soil for your next crop. So once you've collected all your seeds, your seeds are dried like the ones I have here. We then need to find a suitable way of storing them and probably the best way to store seeds is in paper seed packets. There are many different designs but I still go back to this classic seed packet and I've got a design for you here and you should be able to have access to those as well. Um, so I'll make sure that happens. So here we have a small seed pack for our small seeds and a larger seed pack for our larger seeds. The design's pretty simple. Here it is, it's got all the instructions on there. So I will just show you how this works. So here we have the small seed packet design, which we have two per page. You'll just need to cut around the outer edge So once you've cut around that outer edge, you can then fold in on the dotted lines. And what you'll notice is that larger flap around on the edge will then fold over those two smaller ones. Grab some glue. Pop some glue down. Just like that. And then you'll notice you'll have your seed packet. Perfect packet. So once I have finished making my seed packet, um, I might decide then I'm going to put some of my climbing beans in my seed packet here. So what I'll need to remember to do is to put the name on there. The date, which is August 21, when I've harvested them. Put a little picture on there too. And then I'll probably put in a couple of seeds in here. Probably enough for one crop and then just glue down the top and there I have my seed packet okay um next we have our cooking segment um just a few notices notes before we get started watching that next video i um, just want to sort of prepare you guys for if you were to have a cooking class with um, your students 
So it's important when you do start your cooking class that you're in a really good frame of mind because as you might not know if you haven't done this before or if you have done it before, the kids get really excited at the start of these activities and their energy level might, quite often goes incredibly high. So definitely get organised and prepare a safe workspace for your students. Uh, also, there's plenty of recipes out there that require little equipment and today I'll be showing you two recipes that require a very small amount of equipment. Don't feel like you must have a fully functioning kitchen to run a cooking program. Um, use as many ingredients as possible from your school garden. So before you prepare, have a walk around and see what's ready to harvest and just let this determine what you can make. If you don't have much in the garden, purchase some vegetables to boost your quantities for cooking and don't really feel bad about doing that. I think everyone does that who has a cooking and gardening program. Decide before you start if you will be sitting down with your class to share a meal or sending it home with your students or collecting and storing what you've made like jams, preserves um, to sell later at the produce store. I would also let the children do a sample if you're intending on collecting and storing. And most importantly, have some fun. Remember these are memorable activities for your students. And um, I've made copies of these recipes that I'm about to show you. So don't feel you need to write them down. Just I'd like you guys to just sit down, relax and watch. So today we're going to be, I'm going to be making a salad in a jar recipe. There's the vegetable salad in a jar and pickled vegetable salad. So in our cooking segment today, we're going to look at two really, really simple recipes. They're, they're basically just vegetables that we then prepare and present and eat out of jars. So what I've got here is a variety of jars. If you choose to do this with your class, you'll probably end up with the same. You'll get big jars and small jars. And one of the recipes we're going to do is a colorful vegetable salad in a jar. And the other recipe we're going to do today is going to be a pickled vegetable in a jar as well that will keep up to about two weeks if refrigerated, probably longer. Um, the salad will keep up to about two days in your uh, refrigerator as well. So the first thing we're going to do today is to prepare our vegetables that we have. So when we're cutting our um, cauliflower, just cut your cauliflower into florets. small bite-side pieces that the kids will enjoy. You'll find that they will quite happily eat this raw in salads. So when you're cutting up your vegetables, it's a great idea to um, be able to share within a group. So making a nice, either putting them separately in bowls or putting them on a light, nice tray like this. The next one is our red capsicum. When we're cutting our red capsicum, you want to do nice long strips. What you'll probably find is that especially this time of year there won't be that much in season so look at introducing some of these things like capsicums are normally a summer vegetable um, next we'll put in the celery so you want to make sure that's been cleaned chop off the ends um, hopefully you have some celery in your garden you want to um, also cut them similar length to the Red capsicum. And also similar size as well. Uh, next I'm going to add uh, some carrots. So you can choose to peel them or keep them whole. Totally up to, up to you and your decision. Um, I'm just going to clean mine off and keep them as is with the peel on and also just cut them up into sticks. Oh. 
be just some. So next one we're going to do is a cucumber. And we will cut these into strips again. And in half. So just end, cut the ends off the beans. Yeah, that's good. So next we have is radishes, probably a great crop, nice quick crop that will be growing in your school garden at the moment. You can also add things like cooked potatoes to this, sweet potatoes, pumpkins. You could include kale, silver beet and spinach in this as well. Um, so there's lots of options there and also any herbs that you want to add to the to this as well. I'm just going to cut these probably into rounds just to add a bit of sense, bit of difference. Uh, next one is tomatoes. So cherry tomatoes, just slicing those in half. If you've got cabbage or a red cabbage growing in the garden at the moment, this would could be another vegetable you could add to this. Um, the last one we have is the red onion. So this um, would be great as the base on the base of the jar because it enjoys slurping up the um, salads with the dressing and also the pickles. It works really well at the base. So make sure you just slice that nice and finely. So feel free to put um, things like parsley in there. You could also choose to put some silver beet or spinach. I've got some little baby spinach here. I might pop some of these in, in the top as well. They'll look great. Um, if you have any nasturtium flowers or anything like that, feel free to put those in as well got some lemon thyme here I'm just going to put a little bit of that in and we'll just add that point of difference to the salad as well so I'll just put probably some of the younger leaves of some Tuscan kale in as well and maybe some of the more colourful chard would be really good to add in there there's some extra colour not too much okay. so we cut up the greens just to put on top of the salads um, pickled wise probably I don't know if I'd put the silver beet in the pickle, but probably would put the kale in. I reckon that'd be a nice addition. So just small bite size pieces. And a little bit of the spinach. And the parsley. And we'll keep the herbs to the side that we're going to add. I'm going to add chickpeas and I'm going to add pumpkin seeds into the jars as well. Okay so what we have here is we have all of our vegetables all ready 
and also our chickpeas and our pumpkin seeds and some herbs and our jars ready to get started. The first thing I'm going to go over today will be the vegetables in a jar and this is going to be a salad. So the first thing we need to do is to make that salad dressing and put it in the jars. We're going to select our jars so I'm just going at it as you probably would and you'd have a variety of jars so I'm just going to pick this jar here and this jar here and this is what we're going to start with with our salad. So the first thing we add to the jar is two tablespoons of olive oil. Next thing we add is one tablespoon of vinegar. I've just used an apple cider vinegar. The next thing we add is one teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And the last we have is just, you can put salt in there, I prefer not to, but I just add a grinding of pepper as well. We pop the lid back on. It's just a simple dressing and we shake to combine. Okay, the best ingredients to put on the bottom of these jars is always to start with the onions. So I would definitely start by putting some red onions in. The next ingredients, you could then start by stacking them flat. You can go upright, you can go vertical or horizontal. I'm just, because of these particular jars, I'm just choosing to go horizontal. I'm keeping in mind while I'm making this all the time of the colors I'm choosing to layer to make it as interesting as possible. You could decide with your kids, you maybe want to focus on things like the color wheel, keeping things in order. You might choose to follow certain patterns, color patterns with your students as well when you're creating these. Just giving it a press down. Get your kids to try out the florets. You'll probably be surprised that they probably end up really liking them. Some green beans, cucumber. And you could also put in some chickpeas, greens, and then you can top that all off with some seeds. You can also choose to add things like cheeses, like feta in there if you want as well. But I just like a nice vegetarian or vegan meal here. We can put the lid on that and that could then be kept in the fridge for up to two days. You can then just shake the salad through. Um, it's a great dish to take to work. It looks interesting. As you can see, it's a really colourful meal. I think the kids would be really interested in, in making something like this. It would also be great to bring back home and show parents how they can have um, a waste-free and um, green meal. We're going to now have a look at making some of our pickled vegetables. This is a pickled vegetable salad. You can choose to pickle it and eat it the same day or leave it up to a month in the jars. So the first thing we need to do is we need to layer up these jars and fill them with vegetables. So preferably upright for this one. So you can choose to put the jar on the side and just lay these long sticks of vegetables in. I might even put some radishes in since I forgot to put them in the salad, the last one, with the last one. We'll put some broccoli in, the lemon thyme in, and a bay leaf for extra flavour. A bit of garlic, a few more beans in there. I'll just load up the next one. This one's a lot bigger, so I don't know if I'll fill this, but I'll give it a red hot go. You could just choose to fill these up with just one variety of vegetable. Oh, I could put some onion in. I've totally forgotten about those. Some more celery, some capsicum in this one, a bit more red. So you really want to look at getting them really nice and colourful. We'll add a lot of interest. I'm going to put a garlic clove in as well, a bay leaf and some herbs. Might put some of that parsley in as well. Maybe a little bit of kale. I don't see why that can't go in. This is probably one of those ones where you could put in some um, cooked potato, cooked pumpkin in there. So it's starting to look really colourful. We'll pop a radish in. Some more onion. 
So once you've stacked up your jars to how you would like them to look with all the vegetables in there and the kids are happy with what they've got, you then need to add, I've got one uh, teaspoon of coriander seeds and a teaspoon of black peppercorns, reminding the kids that they can't eat the black peppercorns because they're rock hard and they just need to be put in. If you would much rather do grinded pepper, that is totally up to you what you want to do. You know your kids and you know what's best for them. And also the coriander seeds, which adds a lovely flavour when these are pickled. And they can just be shaped through the jar. They'll mix through once the liquid goes in. Okay, so now we come up to the actual preserving liquid that we're going to make and we are going to use a saucepan. I have got my trusty jet boil that I use for hiking. Not necessarily the best thing with kids because it is precarious. You might have some hot plates or you might have a kitchen. I don't know your facilities but I'm just using this because I'm outdoors and this is what I'm comfortable with at the moment. So I'm going to add two cups of water into the saucepan. One cup of vinegar. I'll just use an apple cider vinegar there. It's your choice what you want to add. One teaspoon of sugar and a teaspoon of salt. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to boil that. So So once your water, vinegar, salt and sugar have boiled and they're all dissolved, all the sugar and the salt is dissolved, it's a good idea to get a funnel and then just pour that liquid into the jar. Make sure you go right to the top. Just give it a slight tap to get some of the bubbles going up. And then once it's cooled down, you can then put the lid on. And there you have it, your pickled vegetables. They'll be great for any season. You could do this in summer, winter or spring with any of your vegetables that you have left over in your vegetable garden. Don't forget you can eat them straight away or you can choose to leave them up to a month in your fridge. Okay, so here we have the recipes. Um, they will be available for you as the seed packets as well um, on the Brim Bank website and Karina will make sure that um, they're available probably either probably tomorrow, I think. This is the end of the webinar as such. I just want to say a huge thank you to Karina from Brim Bank Council. who has been an absolute pleasure to work with. And um, I think it's also now a great time to run that second poll, Karina. Yeah, sure, Simone. So I'll just open up the polling now. The question I'm going to ask you all is, has this webinar made you more confident about working in the garden and cooking with your students? Feel free to answer it when it pops up on your screen in just a moment. Fantastic, people are answering very fast. <laughs> That's good. Okay, that probably looks like 90%, nearly there. Yeah, so I think that's that's pretty good right there. Um, just end the poll and share the results. So that's great. So that's great to see that the majority of people feel they can use all these ideas presented and be a really, that's really the aim of this webinar is to give you guys a bit of a break and give you some resources that you guys can use in your um, classes and schools when you go back, which would be great. Okay. 
Okay. So, so next one, it's now time for questions. So I'm going to stop share. And I might just jump in, Simone, and thank you. So thank you, Simone. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. It's educational, fun, and really engaging. I love seeing the food garden at Mother of God Primary School. Your team and the school staff and students really are doing an amazing job there. The plants just look incredible. And the seed tape idea was fantastic. And the salad in the jar was just so bright and colourful. It was just beautiful to look at. I also want to say a huge thank you to everyone for being here today. I really appreciate that you took the time to join us. And as Simone mentioned, we'll open it up for questions now. So let's have a look. I know there was a few, so I'll just check them out on the chat. Um, so I know Leonie sh uh, shared that she did this um, uh, an activity, I think it was the salad um, oh, yeah. activity with the year five students. And she said that um, it went really well. She said, yes, my students did enjoy it and it was an easy thing to do at home using what was in their gardens or in their fridges, trying not to inconvenience families too much. They had to upload the photos as evidence, I love that. <laughs> That's great. And I can see there's lots of comments also about carrots and growing mm. carrots straight. And so that is that thing about having that really friable, very loose soil to grow straight carrots, because I know a lot of people do have issues with twisted carrots. So um, definitely, I find that the um, soil with not that much nutrient in there, it's not rich in compost, but really friable and really loose soil is probably the best for growing carrots. Fantastic. Um, I think there's also a question around the flowers that are edibles uh, and what bush, bush food plants that are easy to grow. Oh, so for starters, bush food plants that are really easy to grow would be, river mint would be probably the top one I would use a lot. I find I've got a lemon scented tea tree in my garden that I use a lot for um, hot drinks and I've used that several times with students as well and also lemon myrtle is another really good one to grow. You can hedge that down and sort of bush that up and keep that small. Um, probably another one would be, if you live down the coast or somewhere quite sunny, would be pig face. If you, but then again too, the fruit of the pig face would be fruiting during school holidays. But you can use the leaves of those for um, salads as well. Let me think, what else do we have that would be great? There's lots of other um, bizarre ones I've used, um, mat rush and things like that, but that's just for pulling those out and nibbling the ends of the mat rush. There's a lot of good bush foods out there um, that you can use. That lot, um, I think that's probably about it with the bush foods that I can rattle off off the top of my brain. Um, and the other question was the flowers as well. So I would definitely be looking at nasturtiums. Great for if you want to cover a large area um, full sun to part sun. Um, nasturtium flowers are great eating. Calendula flowers are really good. Um, you can make a balm with those as well um, and just pick off all the petals off those. And also native violets, so the actual indigenous native violet, you can eat those as well. So they're three off the top of my head I know that you can eat. Any more questions? Oh, yes. oh, Warrigal Greens, um, yes, definitely. <laughs> Warrigal <laughs> Greens are a great one as well. Thanks for that. I can saw that from Mike. Yes, and I've, I've had um, a request to um, view this video again at a later time. So, yeah, I'll definitely be sending around a copy of the recording and we'll also be uploading it onto our school's education website. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, Gabrielle said... Uh, I love the chickens. <laughs> I know. The, I, yeah, the silky bantams are a beautiful breed for children. They're really docile and um, they've got that lovely, gorgeous little bantam egg and they're just adorable birds to have. And I think if any kind of, I think chickens within schools, I've just found bantams to be a great breeding type of bantam breeds, great within the school system. They're great chickens, love them. 
Yes. Can you write down the first flower name? I didn't catch it. Nasturtium, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be nasturtium. Easy to grow, self seed, wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, so I think that's most of the questions. Um, if anyone wants to um, have a chat and share uh, tips and tricks that have worked well for them, um, Feel free to put your hand up in the um, participant tab and we can um, unmute you if you'd like to share anything before we finish up or if you do have a, a question, one last question, feel free to put it in the chat. Is that possibly it? You can see a few thank yous. Well, chat. any recommendations on pest management? Yeah, I would definitely use garlic sprays with pest management. And I'd also not do monoculture planting where you're planting just one variety in one area. I'd mix things up a little bit to confuse the pests so they don't just go from one plant to another. So if you're looking at things like um, aphids, definitely garlic sprays. You can also squash the aphids onto the plants and that deters them as well. Um, if you're looking at um, larger pests like birds, then definitely look into netting and the laws have changed around netting too. So we need, um, now there's a smaller hole size with the nets as well. So the old netting size, we have to get rid of all of those and we can't retell them or anything. We have to just dispose of them safely. So um, what else is there? Uh, hi Ruth from RD South. <laughs> <laughs> okay how can you make garlic spray um what you can do is you can crush up a garlic um in and you make a paste out of that um you can use a normal spray bottle if you put the garlic into say for instance like um some material and just tie the end off so it, the garlic doesn't um go right around the water it means that the spray doesn't get clogged and you just let that garlic sit in the water probably for about a day and then the next day you're able to use that. Uh, any recommendations for purchasing, purchasing indigenous foods? You can buy indigenous foods from most garden centres now. Um, Karanga up in Mount Evelyn, which is a uh, native nursery, they have a quite a good bush food section. So that's Karanga, Karanga Nursery. Um, but you can buy things like um, finger limes at most um, nurseries now and they're in the um, citrus section quite often. Newport Lakes Nursery, there you go. Um, I'm, I'm in the Dandenong, so I'm not familiar with that side. So, very different for me. Oh, Bulleen Arts and Garden, definitely. They're great as well. And Ceres are fantastic as well if you're near Brunswick. Thanks for that, Mike. Okay, I think we're done. Fantastic. Well, I might take this opportunity to thank you all once again for joining us today. If you have any suggestions on how we can better support you during these times, then please let us know. I hope you had fun and I hope to see you at another environmental event soon. Wonderful, thank you very much.